hello and welcome to Open Classroom. It's the Brown School's digital forum for community and for conversation. We are so glad that you're here with us today. Um, I'm Laurie McConnell. I'm communications coordinator here at the Brown School. And if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping stuff right at the beginning. Um, the first thing is to let you know that this is a webinar format which means that you can see and hear us, but unfortunately we don't get to see or hear you, but we are very curious what you're thinking. We would love to know your questions. So please feel free at any time to put a question or a thought into the chat. At the end of the program, we'll have a question and answer session and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible, but we really do want to know what you're thinking and what you would like to know. Uh, also, just to let you know that we're streaming live right now on YouTube. So if you uh, have a colleague or a Friend who wasn't able to get registered for the program and can't be in the Zoom room with us today, I in just a second, I will post that uh, link to our YouTube channel in the chat so you can share that with them. And you can also watch the program there and on our Open Classroom website, we'll record it and you can watch it there afterwards. Uh, so I will put the, uh, the um, Open Classroom website link in the chat as well. And just to tell you about a couple of Open Classroom webinars that are coming up, we are going to continue our Building a Transformative 21st Century Research Agenda series this Thursday, October 13th, with a program called Collaborating with Family Peer Advocates in Child Mental Health Research. Then next Thursday, October 20th, another in that series, Collaborative Approaches to Addressing Historical and Intergenerational Trauma. And then on Thursday, October 27th, we have another in our Artificial Intelligence series called The Internet of Medical Things, Predicting Clinical Out comes with wearables. So if you want to learn more about those or get registered, we would love for you to do that. They're free and they're better when you join us. So now to today's program, I am very pleased to introduce you to uh, the wonderful, at least one of the wonderful faces on our screen. Dr. Fred Soamala is the William E. Gordon Distinguished Professor, Associate Dean for Transdisciplinary Faculty Research at the Brown School and founding director of the International Center for Child Health and Development, or iChad. And uh, Dr. Fred is going to introduce us to our wonderful presenter today. So I will get off screen and leave it to you two gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, those ones, I know that we have um, attendees from across the globe, and I'm enjoying a very nice weather here in St. Louis. Um, I want to introduce myself again, but uh, I have the pleasure of introducing a friend and a colleague uh, someone that really I got to meet when we are all being funded by NIH. I think when I met John, uh, Dr. John and Aslanda, by then I think he was working with a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Lisa Marsh at uh, Danforth. I, I think he has visited Uganda and, and now he's um, a colleague that uh, really does a similar work, like uh, the work that uh, we do here at ICHAD um, at, at, at Harvard. But anyway, let me give you, um, allow me, for those ones of you who know me, you know that I, I tend not to read, but I have a full page of bio, a bio sketch. Uh, that's how accomplished our, our presenter is, but I read a few pieces out of it. Uh, so Dr. John Nasland is um, an instructor of global health and social med medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School. He holds expertise in psychiatry, epidemiology, implementation science, social disparities, uh, social disparities research, and digital mental health. Um, overall, his scholarship seeks to advance efforts aimed at improving the lives of individuals facing challenges of mental illness worldwide. Um, he has had numerous projects primarily focused on low resource settings, uh, and he has three thematic areas that I really want to highlight here. He focuses on digital technology for training and building capacity for non-special workers. Uh, he does digital technology for health promotion. And then he also, the third piece that really does is digital technology as a platform for peer-to-peer -peer support. He's very accomplished in terms of publication. His work appears in the New England Journal of Medicine, in the Lancet, and Journal of Preventive Medicine. Um, so we are extremely very fortunate to have him today uh, to be able to share some of what he's done, how he does it, 
and how some of our trainees and our attendees can, can get involved in this work. John, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for doing this. I don't know whether I was supposed to make any announcements about iChat, but I will reserve those announcements to the end where my colleague, uh, Laura Pia, will be able to make those announcements. But John, I'll take it from here and you are very much welcome. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fred, for the very, very kind in introduction uh, and invitation to present. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you and, and uh, uh, Dr. McKay and uh, Dr. Osgay as well for, for the invitation. I'm really, you know, really delighted to be presenting to your, uh, to your group um, on this topic today. So I am just going to make sure I can share my screen um, and not have any kind of technical problems and want to make sure that everyone can see it. Um, so I'm going to make the assumption that it's there unless uh, hopefully I'll, I'll hear from someone if it's not showing up. But um, so I'm, my presentation today is really going to focus on uh, the role of digital technology. I, I'm really glad um, that uh, Dr. Fred highlighted some of the areas, uh, you know, thematic areas of my work. But I'm really going to be focusing on the first one, really thinking of the uh, capacity building and working, building workforce capacity. <clears throat> so, OK, all right. So I, yeah, some of the key things I'm gonna uh, cover in my presentation today is really just kind of thinking of some of the ways digital technology can assist in mental health care delivery. Uh, again, with a major emphasis on capacity building and uh, addressing workforce shortages. Um, thinking of what some of the benefits or limitations might be of using technology. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk a bit about this uh, concept um, we call reciprocal learning or reverse translation, or, you know, there's a number of different uh, terms for it, but basically uh, thinking of how we can apply technology in ways to address gaps in access to mental health care in low resource settings, um, but not thinking confined to say one country or one geographic area, but really thinking how that applies across potentially both uh, low resource settings uh, in a domestic context. So here in the United States, as well as low resource settings in, uh, in global contexts and in, in lower income countries globally. Um, so really trying to think of that idea and I'll present some examples from my work. Um, yeah, so every time I, you know, it's a little different when we're in the classroom, but I just want some, you know, put some questions up here to, to give, uh, you know, to get some ideas going about the role of digital mental health or what exactly this means. And usually when I'm presenting this topic uh, to a group of students, kind of like to have a bit of discussion about what exactly this means, because I know that everyone who comes into a talk about digital mental health probably has some idea about it, what it means, what it's for, what technology means for your mental health before they've actually uh, joined the talk. It's probably what maybe piqued your interest uh, and why you maybe were, you know, interested in in hearing what I have to say today. So I always am very curious about sort of the ideas. Um, I don't expect, you know, really responses to this today, but really just to kind of, you know, some, some ideas to think about. Um, when we think of digital mental health, I, I know what comes to mind usually is, you know, what we think of in the news. Um, you know, there's just oftentimes typically kind of negative impacts of technology on mental health or how does technology influence our mental health. Um, that, that's certainly an area of, uh, you know, of interest, um, not one that I will focus on a great deal today. But what does often come up in the news is things like, you know, mobile apps for, for you know, depression or how can apps help with mental health care. Um, there's a lot of emphasis nowadays about technology and our mental health and how technology can maybe address mental health care uh, challenges. So I think it's a, it's a, you know, certainly a hot topic. It's something that's come up more and more, especially over the course of the pandemic. Um, I also want you to think about what are some of the, you know, challenges or pitfalls that come to mind. So just thinking of, you know, your everyday use of technology or uh, your knowledge of mental health care, where does technology either, uh, you know, face challenges and actually being used? Or how do you think, you know, if you were going to deploy a digital tool uh, in a low resource setting, what would be some of the challenges to, to actually achieving success with making that work uh, towards addressing a mental health concern? Uh, and then, you know, then also thinking, what are some of the advantages? Because I, again, we often have a, a fairly negative frame when it comes to technology, even though it's, a, you know, they're often tools that we we like, uh, we use, uh, we, you know, we enjoy using um, and they help us in a lot of ways. Um, so a lot of the kind of the, you know, the perception is often quite negative, but there's also many, many advantages. And those have absolutely come to light in recent years, um, both through evidence, but then also uh, as we've seen a, a increasing reliance on technology, especially over the course of the pandemic. So I think it's also important to think of some of the advantages uh, when we think of this. Um, so this I think is, 
probably pretty well known to, to this audience today, but um, so mental health disorders are a leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, this is true across most, uh, most countries. Um, the burden of mental disorders uh, it tends to be disproportionately, um, it, there's a disp disproportionate burden of mental disorders among uh, low income and middle income countries. Uh, so much of my work is based in, in lower income countries and I'll, I'll um, <clears throat> uh, just you know, talk about that further. Um, but one thing that is also common um, across all countries is that very, very few individuals who live with mental illness uh, actually have access to quality mental health care. Um, this is true in you know, virtually you know, any setting across the globe. Um, even in higher income countries uh, and countries that spend a great deal of money on mental health care, uh, such as the United States, um, access to actual quality of care uh, and treatment outcomes are, are really um, really poor and lag behind many, many other countries uh, that invest a considerably smaller amount of money actually towards achieving those outcomes. Um, so even though there's really this terrible access to mental health care, uh, this is not because we don't have treatments that work. And I always try to, you know, emphasize that at the beginning. Um, so, you know, I've focused a lot of my work on implementation. So thinking of how can we get practices that, that are effective, uh, or interventions that are effective into practice. But when it comes to treatment of mental illness, we have one of the strongest, uh, you know, evidence, one of the strongest evidence base uh, in, out of any condition, uh, you know, any group of conditions in the world uh, in terms of what we know works. Um, it's just an absolute failure to actually get these interventions that work uh, into practice. Um, and when I'm speaking of interventions that work, I, I focus a lot on psychological interventions or psychosocial interventions. So essentially non-pharmacological treatments. Um, they're often uh, grounded in psychological sciences. Uh, and there's a very, very robust evidence base uh, in support of this broad range of uh, psychosocial interventions. And these can be effective ranging all the way from uh, more common mental disorders, things like anxiety or depression, uh, all the way to um, helping uh, individuals manage lifelong, uh, more debilitating mental illnesses, such as severe mental illness and psychoses. Um, so these programs are supported by you know, a very robust body of evidence. Um, and this body of evidence is actually especially strong uh, drawing from uh, low income and middle income countries. In fact, there was a study, um, a, a large meta review and umbrella review and meta analysis published in The Lancet um, only about two years ago, uh, really summarizing the evidence from over 100 clinical trials uh, conducted across uh, low income and middle income countries around the globe, really demonstrating strong, robust evidence for the use of these psychosocial interventions across a wide range of mental disorders. Uh, th there's very few conditions that have this type of you know, strength of evidence. Um, yet, even with this evidence, there's a, you know, there's challenges to actually making sure that these these treatments, these interventions, these programs are delivered in community settings, in routine care settings, in other settings, basically where uh, they can reach individuals who could benefit the most from these from these uh, interventions. Um, so, when we think of what are the barriers to actually trying to address this, so I, I mentioned that you know a lot of my work focuses on implementation. Uh, it's an area of great interest. Um, you know, thinking of technology is actually a tool for addressing implementation challenges, um, and there's many, many challenges to implementation, but I often try to, you know, think about how can we focus this really on, um, you know, if we we're going to distill this down and sorry to summarize it on one slide, uh, these are sort of three key barriers. And I'll focus on these. And this is not to say there aren't other barriers. There's many, many barriers to, to implementation. But the reason I think these ones are especially important and especially important in the context of psychosocial interventions um, is because, well, first of all, for content. So the content of these interventions has always been, you know, highly academic, uh, you know, developed in, you know, academic settings uh, by predominantly white researchers uh, in high income countries. That's basically the grounding in psychological sciences. Um, this is built, you know, on, on decades of research in, you know, mostly from the United States and the UK, uh, so a few other, uh, you know, countries predominantly, again, uh, in either Western Europe uh, or, or um, North America. Um, well, that body of evidence that I mentioned from, from low-income and middle-income countries found it demonstrated that you can actually take the content from these psychological interventions, adapt it to local cultures, local contexts, change the language, of course, but there's more to it than just the language. There's also adapting it to the local setting. Uh, and you can achieve very comparable outcomes in terms of addressing a mental disorder. So the content can be simplified. 
uh, the content can be made approachable to you know ordinary people, basically people who don't have advanced degrees, uh, who don't have advanced training in mental health care. That's really a key thing: is how do we make this content essentially something that's uh, you know open access, available, and usable uh, by regular you know uh, regular individuals uh, who are in positions where they could potentially deliver this to people who need help. So the content, I think, I feel like, you know, that's one thing where the technology can really play a key role, and I'll, I'll speak more to that. Um, the supply is sort of the next piece on there. So even once you've made the content approachable and understandable, you need somebody who can deliver it. Uh, and that's really the task sharing component. So how do you then shift those skills to individuals? But how do you do that at scale? Um, and the issue with, you know, one of the bottlenecks in traditional, you know, task sharing models, basically having non-specialists or community health workers or lay, lay persons uh, trained to deliver uh, interventions for mental disorders, the challenge is always the sort of the bottleneck around the actual training and actually scaling up the, the um, scale, scaling up the actual skill building process and, and the support for actually gaining these skills um, and ensuring that you have the competencies uh, necessary to effectively deliver care. Um, so that is, again, another piece is the supply component. And the third one is one that often is overlooked um, and is, is often overlooked actually in general in mental health care, um, uh, especially in settings where there are, you know, such as the United States, where there actually might be care available. Um, the quality standards of that care is not always taken into, in, into consideration carefully. Um, and this is especially important if we're thinking of how do we scale up effective psycho, psychosocial interventions in low resource settings. Uh, we've figured out how to make the content approachable. We've identified a workforce who can be trained. The next step is really making sure that they're supported uh, in delivering that care. And this really uh, you know, this really goes back to um, the delivery of mental health care, even though we can train community health workers or train non-specialists, it's very complex work. Uh, you're working with individuals who are in distress, uh, who may be in very difficult life circumstances. So it can be a very challenging uh, type of care to deliver uh, and therefore requires ongoing quality assurance and ongoing support uh, so that someone doesn't become burned out um, or frustrated in, in, in that role, because that can happen. There's often uh, you know, experiences of burnout for health workers who are left alone uh, and in settings not supported to deliver uh, mental health care. So taking these kind of these major barriers into context, I must think about how uh, the role of possible technology could actually uh, help address this. Um, this also aligns closely with, um, you know, the WHO models for thinking about how can we, uh, you know, really build capacity of, um, you know, the, the portion of the pyramid where there's not necessarily the high level of expertise, the high level of clinical expertise. Because again, you do, it's, not, it's not that the specialists are not required. I wanna make that especially important. There's, they play a key role uh, in addressing more complex cases, but when we think of trying to make mental health care more widely available, um, then we certainly need to think about ways to build capacity of this, um, uh, you know, the, the, this lower part of the, of, the, of the pyramid, thinking about how we can reach the most individuals uh, in community settings uh, and thinking, yes, community health workers, but then even uh, members of, you know, community members, it could be, you know, villagers, it could be, um, you know, teachers in schools, uh, it could be, you know, really any range of individuals who could, who are at a position where they may be able to reach individuals in need of support. So this is where, um, you know, one of my key interests is thinking about how do we, you know, think outside the box, what are some of the innovative ways to overcome these challenges, uh, and this is where I see uh, the role of technology really uh, being critical uh, in, in, work, in helping us uh, work to addressing these gaps. Um, this is a slide that I feel like I'm constantly updating. So this is uh, the, the We Are Social site. I mean, I always find it pretty striking, you know, these, these numbers, exactly how, you know, what portion of the globe uh, has access to various forms of digital technology. Uh, I do think it's important to keep in mind um, that there's, there remains significant gaps in access. There's certainly uh, um, you know, equity issues in, in terms of access among the most uh, low resource settings. Um, also, uh, women have considered considerably lower access to digital devices than men across most settings, uh, especially in, in, in lower income settings globally. Uh, but still, there's incredible uh, increase in access the other piece too that's really important to, to take into consideration is the quality of the access itself. So even though technology is a tool that many of us have access to, and uh, you know it's increasingly used around the globe, um, that quality of access, the quality of the connection, the quality of the device uh, can be variable. 
Uh, so these numbers don't really tell us anything about how good a connection. Yes, so that's great that 63% of the pop global population has uh, uses the internet, but that doesn't mean that 63% have you know high speed bandwidth and can access it at any time, and you know have you know basically unhindered access. Um, this is important to keep in mind because when we think of interventions that use technology. Um, keeping in mind how someone uses their technology or what their level of access is, is incredibly important in thinking of how they could potentially benefit uh, from a digital mental health uh, intervention. So again, there's a clear opportunity. Um, we certainly know that there's increasing recognition of the impact of mental, uh, you know, mental disorders globally. Uh, we have this robust evidence base for brief psychological treatments uh, and psychosocial interventions. Uh, we know that task sharing models are effective. Uh, and now we have this increasing access to digital technology, which we know has been accelerated over the course of the pandemic. Um, there's also, this is, you know, many of these recommendations have also uh, been, you know, been written for some time. Uh, the WHO has recommended use of digital tools for supporting training and learning uh, for health workers for, for many years. Um, and yet there remains challenges in thinking about how to actually realize this, and especially how to do this at scale uh, in, in a low resource setting. So I'm going to present a case example from uh, India. So India is one of the one of the places where uh, uh, most of my work is based. I, uh, most of the work I'm involved in is split between India and, and the United States. Um, much of my work is in collab well, in my work in India is in collaboration with an organization called Sangath. Uh, they're a uh, a leading uh, research NGO um, focused uh, heavily on on mental health care. They've led some of the largest um, trials in global mental health. Um, dating from, you know, from uh, about uh, over the last 25 years. So the Bhopal hub in particular, where I, I do my work is in the center of India in a state called Madhya Pradesh uh, has been around for, for just over 10 years uh, since 2011. Um, so just a little bit about uh, where most of my work is based. So, so Bhopal, uh, again, it's in the, in the center of India. Um, it's a highly rural area. It's, uh, there's many lakes, um, there's many historic sites in Bhopal. Um, it has, uh, you know, you know, fascinating uh, cultural heritage. Uh, again, many of these sites that are, you know, quite uh, historic. Um, and uh, it's also the tiger state for India. I was highlight this because there's many national parks. Uh, one of the reasons why that's important is there's many areas that are, you know, remote uh, or, um, they have a dispersed population in the states. Um, I don't want to say it's uh, sparsely populated. It's a very large population in Madhya Pradesh, about 75 million people, but spread out over an enormous geographic area um, with, uh, you know, uh, many, many small villages without, uh, you know, huge connectivity between these villages in terms of, um, uh, you know, roadways and so forth. Um, again, many historic sites, uh, but as I mentioned, it's a, it's a largely rural state, which means that there's many challenges in thinking about how do you actually deliver care uh, and deliver interventions effectively uh, when, uh, you know, compensating for some of these challenges, these logistic challenges. Um, so this example is really focused on how to build capacity of a community health worker workforce uh, in, in this state. Um, they're called the ASHA workers. So in India, there's a um, health worker called ASHAs. They're accredited social health activists. Uh, so A-S-H-A. And they essentially represent the backbone of the health system in India. They deliver care uh, across you know, most states in the country, across predominantly rural areas, even in urban settings. Uh, and they are you know, responsible for everything from maternal and child health, which was one of their primary uh, you know, one of their core responsibilities when the program was first launched, um, but then now have been increasingly taken on uh, a lot of non-communicable disease care, so NCD care, uh, with mental health care being one of uh, one of those um, one of those treatments. So this is I am highlighting work from the Essence program. So this was uh, one of the scale up hubs. Uh, so Dr. Fred scale up is the, the Smart Africa hub, which I'm sure many of you may be uh, aware of. Uh, essentially, we're one of 10 of these NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health funded uh, scale up hubs really focused on how to address implementation challenges uh, in, in thinking about how to get interventions uh, for uh, a wide range of mental disorders into routine care settings. Uh, and our focus was really thinking about how to um, build capacity at the, at the workforce capacity in delivery of depression care and primary care settings uh, in rural India. 
So a lot of our work uh, builds on um, close to a decade of formative research, working very closely with the, the ASHA workers. Uh, and then also in our early days, you know, early stages of the, the Essence program, we conducted a number of interviews with community health workers, really thinking about this is, you know, this was our target audience. We were going to train, uh, we were going to train them in an evidence-based psychological treatment uh, for, for depression, uh, and really learning, learning from them about, first of all, their openness to receive this type of training, their interest. Um, and I think what was most striking in the early days of this work, and I say this because this is now about, about four years ago, um, was that there was really high recognition of the impact of mental, uh, mental health problems in their communities. Um, and this, this one example here, this quote was taken from an ASHA worker who talked about if she, she felt as if she'd had the skills that we, you know, we were telling her about, then she could have maybe saved uh, someone's life in, in her village. Um, many of them spoke of instances of suicide uh, that was familiar to most of them. Uh, or other circumstances where they've often felt helpless uh, and unable to respond to the needs of, of the communities they were serving. So there was a real interest um, in learning more about how, how to address these problems. Now, recognizing this is a sample that came to, to participate in research interviews, um, so there may have been uh, some selection bias, but this has now emerged over the last four years across a number of contexts and across dozens and dozens, well now hundreds of other health workers. So it's becoming something that I don't think this was maybe a self-selecting group, but something that really is uh, widely viewed across uh, many, many health workers being a very serious concern in their villages, uh, in their communities uh, and in the healthcare that they deliver. So we engaged this group, uh, you know, this cohort of, of uh, ASHA workers. We worked with a group in a, in a rural district in. Uh, in Madhya Pradesh called the Sihor district, uh, and really initiated this with a series of kind of design workshops, really trying to think what we wanted to do was basically learn from them. Well, we have this training, and now we need to think about, first of all, how to adapt it to uh, meet the needs of uh, the context. I think, you know, taking into consideration um, the level of education of these health workers, the language, uh, local culture, what would be appropriate to include in the training, um, and, and the content, but then also thinking, how do we digitize this? Because that was the other key piece, is we were going to leverage technology. And this goes back to the concerns around the vast geographic area, just it quite simply not being practical um, to go and deliver the training in traditional methods, which would be in-person classroom-based training. Uh, we had to think of ways to, that uh, we could overcome those challenges with classroom-based training. So the manual, uh, the treatment, essentially, it's an, a manualized treatment. Uh, it's a behavioral activation treatment, essentially. It's called the Healthy Activity Program. This had originally been developed, uh, adapted and evaluated in India in a large randomized controlled trial. Um, and this was, uh, this was published back in 2017. Uh, but essentially, this large trial demonstrated that this program was effective for treating uh, depression in a setting in India. Now, the original trial was conducted in a very different setting than where the current project was, was based. Uh, the trial was initially conducted in Goa, so the, the manual was, was uh, still in English, uh, and we were adapting it for this new setting. We were also adapting it for delivery from a different group of health workers. I mentioned uh, we, worked we were working closely with the ASHA workers, so we had to think about uh, the level of education for the ASHA workers, which is a, a minimum usually of eighth standard, so uh, they don't typically have, um, uh, you know, they may not have a, you know, a bachelor's degree or even a high school education. Um, they are literate, but uh, again, there are uh, lower education levels in this particular cohort. So we had to think about how to take these manuals. Uh, one, there were, there were really, there's one program, but essentially two manuals, one describing effective counseling skills, um, called the, the counseling relationship manual. And then the healthy activity program, which was really the treatment specific manual focused on uh, the skills needed to de effectively deliver behavioral activation. Now, behavioral activation is um, one of the components of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's demonstrated um, if similar effectiveness to cognitive behavioral therapy in head to head trials conducted in the, in the UK, uh, and then also clinical effectiveness in, in trials conducted initially in, in the United States, but then now these have been replicated. Uh, in many, many countries across the globe, uh, including in India in this, uh, in this study from 2017 that I mentioned. But the challenge is thinking about how do you take these paper-based manuals, you know, typical academic manuals, uh, and put, turn those into something that can be accessed from a smartphone, uh, something that's you know, interesting to the target audience, uh, but then also simplified to the extent that it's easy to understand, but then doesn't 
uh, lose any of the core, you know, the ingredients essentially that are required to, to um, you know, to ensure that the program uh, is effective. So this process, this, uh, this graphic dramatically oversimplifies this process. Uh, we engaged in this through, uh, you know, initially through a series of workshops and kind of these storyboarding activities. Uh, we were trying to think about, well, how do we get this text-based content onto an app? You know, what is the way to do this? We tried a variety. We, we, you know, we created a number of different prototypes, mostly built in-house. I uh, tested them in sort of small groups of ASHA workers. Uh, this idea of kind of, uh, you know, taking small, uh, you know, small prototypes, iterating, getting feedback on the spot. We did these design workshops directly with the ASHA workers. Um, we had ideas that weren't so good. They, they didn't make it to the final cut. You know, we tried things like animations uh, and we learned pretty quickly that, you know, for animations, um, you know, pretty well anyone around the world now, if they have access to a mobile device has probably seen YouTube. And if they've used YouTube, uh, then they've probably seen Pixar. And if they've seen Pixar, then they probably don't think the animations you make are any good because it's, I can tell you that we can't, we can't emulate what, uh, you know, what is available um, online. So our, anima our animations really did not look so good. Um, and they told us that, you know, they said these, these don't look very good. So we were thinking, well, what is one thing that, and they talked about using, so we asked them actually then some other questions, trying to better understand how they actually use their phones. Because some of them did have access to phones. About half our sample of, of ASHA workers we found had access to smartphones. They all had digital devices like a, um, uh, you know, a, a classic phone. I forget what they're even called, the classic phone, the non-smartphone. Non um, but about half had access to smartphones. And they talked about using you know, their smartphones to watch videos. So then that really kind of sparked an interest in us in thinking of, well, maybe video-based content. So that, that was really our key to thinking of how do we take, you know, the course materials, the manuals, and turning those into short videos similar to what they might use on YouTube. Um, they also talked about how they were very interested in the idea of using technology. I, you know, partly we were handing them devices to use, but they also mentioned that this is a way for them to avoid having to come to the tradition, you know, the typical in-person training. So most of the training, uh, to give some context, most of the training in India is done, had been done, or continues to be done in person. Um, where it's you know done at these kind of residential facilities, they're government run. It's not it's not something that most health workers enjoy going to do because it takes them away from their their families and their family responsibilities, uh, and they sort of have to stay in this you know in this facility uh, for about you know five or six days usually. Um, so this they felt could avoid you know if they use the technology they could avoid having to do that. Um, they also felt you know they travel a great deal of um, I mean, they spend a great deal of time on buses traveling huge distances from you know the different villages. Uh, they felt they could use the device um, on the on the bus and learn the content while they're riding the bus. They felt that would be a good use of their time. So we came up with this process. Um, this was really drawing from uh, existing um, frameworks for focused, you know, in the in the design literature and the in, and there's a you know a huge amount of uh, literature on on human centered design and how to design an effective app. Um, and we we really tried to draw from that that literature as well as the educational literature to think of a process for how we could take the content from these manuals uh, and then develop it into uh, video-based content uh, supplemented with other digital content on a mobile app uh, and then pilot test this to ensure that it would be effective. So initially required this idea of creating a blueprint, you know, really taking what are the core contents from the manuals, the, you know, the key ingredients, uh, and then having this reviewed by experts and making sure that this would then be reflected uh, throughout the development of the videos. Uh, and then also uh, up when uploaded onto the digital platform. Uh, and this involves also not only engagement of experts to ensure fidelity to the treatment model, uh, the treatment manuals, but then also ongoing feedback and prototype testing uh, with the frontline health workers, making sure that the language is appropriate, uh, and then also making sure that the, the, the devices were working appropriately um, and the content would load, effect, you know, when you open it, it would load properly. Um, so we initially uh, leveraged the platform, a Moodle platform, which is pretty widely known. Uh, it's a learning management system. Uh, and part of the reason for, for this platform is because that we could get the content loaded onto the digital device without requiring a uh, continuous wireless uh, connectivity. We learned very quickly in our piloting uh, that um, connectivity was very poor. Um, and many of the ASHA workers only had, uh, you know, wireless connectivity when they were in larger villages. When they were at home uh, or uh, you know, working in some of the smaller, uh, really, really small villages, they did not have good connectivity. It was only kind of if they went to a central health facility uh, or a larger town, then and they could reconnect. 
Um, so we had to think about how to navigate those concerns. Um, and then I mentioned we used created video-based content. So this is a Zaz from our team and he's one of the intervention coordinators. So it was often kind of lecture videos like this, but then also a lot of role play videos. So trying to recreate these scenarios of actually delivering care in an actual setting. Um, some of them were, we had film, filmed actually at, uh, at some of the, the rural clinics. Um, some of them were filmed in our office uh, based on where, you know, what, what logistically was possible, but basically all the content was developed in a way that would reflect um, something that would be familiar um, uh, in terms of setting for the for the uh, community health workers. Um, so this led to a large trial. So I'm going to present just some results from this trial, which are you know the the trial is now complete and the results are uh, uh, in in press. But essentially, this led to a large trial where we uh, compared this digital form of training um, to two additional forms of training. So the gold standard uh, in-person face-to-face training. So that's the, you know, the gold standard is classroom-based instructions. So that was our, you know, our control arm. Then we had um, what we call the digital training, the DGT. That was the, the mobile app essentially by itself. Um, but then when we were looking at the literature and also in our pilot testing, we learned that, uh, well, you can give someone an app with uh, access to the digital training, uh, but it's often hard to kind of motivate someone to keep going. This is incredibly consistent with all digital health literature. It's one of the challenges with digital mental health. I was mentioning earlier, what are some of the challenges or pitfalls? And sustained engagement and motivation to continue using the app um, across basically any setting is, is, is uh, repeatedly emerges as a challenge. So we were trying to think, well, how, you know, how can we encourage the ASHA workers to, um, you know, complete the training or to, you know, com, you know, you continue using the app. So we developed a coaching protocol um, and this was informed by some of the, uh, you know, some of the intervention literature uh, where coaches have been used effectively in a wide range of interventions, actually from some of the uh, HIV literature, from some of the, um, uh, actually some of the like health promotion, uh, you know, cardiovascular literature and diabetes literature as well. <laughs> Excuse me. So really thinking about how can we um, leverage this idea of a coaching model uh, to promote engagement uh, and you know interacting with the training. So we had a coach on our basically someone from our team who would contact participants and be kind of you know offer motivation and encouragement so that they could uh, continue and proceed through uh, through the training. Um, I think what was really key for us is that, you know, so this was a non-inferiority trial. So we weren't trying to show that one training was better than the other. We were really just trying to show that if you had the digital training, that it would be as good as the, you know, the gold standard face-to-face uh, -face training. Our primary outcome from this training is a, a measure of competency that our team developed. Um, it was intended to capture both the skills and the knowledge, primarily focused on knowledge because it was a multiple choice questionnaire. Um, and it was designed in a way that would be um, scalable to deliver uh, across this, you know, across a large trial like this, because we had about 339 um, community health workers enrolled. So this slide here really demonstrates that what we found is actually that all three arms uh, showed improvement, which was, you know, I, I think a, a important finding. Uh, but the most striking finding is that our, our digital plus the coaching um, and the face-to-face, -face, you know, the classroom-based instruction both performed better than the digital alone, which is not, not a huge surprise. So when you just give someone an app, they may not uh, do as well than if you give them the app with the addition of, of coaching support. Um, so some of the next steps from this work, we are, uh, you know, this is really focused now on thinking about the next steps around implementation. Uh, and now that these ASHA workers have been trained, thinking of how to now support them in the delivery of this care uh, within the health system. Um, so I like to highlight this graph here um, to really show that, you know, our emphasis initially was heavily on the training. So thinking about, you know, how to train and build the skills and competencies, um, but now shifting to thinking about how to actually support them in the delivery. So offering supervision uh, and this I mentioned earlier, this ongoing quality assurance. Uh, so this is kind of thinking of depression care across the continuum, but now really moving uh, to how to support uh, quality assurance. Uh, just one second. So the quality assurance um, piece, and this is kind of another exciting use of technology in our work. Uh, and this is a, a, a new project that's 
come out of the Essence program. Um, it's uh, funded by Grand Challenges Canada. Uh, and uh, the, our, our lead on this project is uh, Daisy Singlet at the University of Toronto. Uh, but essentially taking, how can we develop a mobile app that could support ongoing peer supervision? So thinking of these same health workers, they've done the uh, digital training, now thinking how can they then use a, a mobile app uh, that can support them uh, in ongoing kind of uh, uh, ongoing quality assurance. So we've partnered with a company called uh, Demagi, and they have a uh, what's called the ComCare app, which has been uh, you know widely deployed across uh, dozens of countries in many low resource settings, um, and for supporting community health workers. Uh, and one you know important piece about the ComCare app is that it's also been widely used in India, so it's familiar to the target, uh, you know, a community health worker, but also has demonstrated uh, acceptability and feasibility uh, in, in the setting where we're working. Uh, so this involves the, this peer supervision process. Essentially, when patients, when the um, community health workers see patients, then they record their sessions and keep track of these. It helps them basically tracking their sessions through the app, but it actually involves a peer component. So not only do they rate and track their own settings, uh, their peers or a group of other health workers also rate, set, rate their sessions, uh, and then they meet on a, a in either weekly or biweekly basis uh, to then <clears throat> review sessions together. Um, and this is just some screenshots of what the app looks like. This is now being rolled out um, in, in Madhya Pradesh. So I mentioned we, we trained about 339 health workers in that original trial. Uh, the training now has been extended to over 1,000 health workers in the same state. Uh, and they have now begun uh, delivering care uh, with the support of this app. We've um, delivered, uh, developed this or adapted this app over the last year, uh, and it's now being deployed uh, to support this ongoing uh, peer supervision component, uh, which is key for ensuring quality of uh, the delivery of the depression care uh, intervention. Uh, so this really ties into this idea of kind of thinking of a, a continuum of uh, a progression for community health workers. So thinking of you know, we had these ASHA workers who had no prior experience in mental health care. They're new learners. Um, they're introduced to this content. Then how do we then support them so that they be gaining the competency and skills to deliver this care? Uh, and then they, the process can then cycle over where then they can help facilitate the supervision for the next cohort of community health workers who complete the training uh, and so on. So thinking of really um, a sustainability model uh, for how the all the, throughout all of this, using digital tools to facilitate this, but thinking about how to sustain this, uh, this ongoing uh, training and then ongoing uh, peer support provision uh, with, with um, the use of technology uh, to support the you know, scale up of depression care. So scale up is yes, is one part of it, but then also sustainability, which is uh, incredibly key uh, in thinking of this work. So that's, that's a kind of a, a vision for where where you know, where this work is going uh, with the ultimate goal of, of having this integrated uh, within the health system completely. Um, so this has also led to uh, the launch of a program called Empower. Uh, and essentially Empower is uh, focused on taking these digital solutions uh, for building uh, mental health, uh, building workforce capacity uh, to deliver mental health care uh, globally. Um, so this has involved uh, really um, it, one, you know, key collaboration actually in the United States, and this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of reciprocal learning, uh, where the work in India is now informing work uh, in, in the United States. So I've been really excited to have this, this partnership in Texas. This is a new project um, in collaboration with Meadows uh, Mental Health Policy Institute, as well as other Scott and White Health System, which is a, a large health system in, in Texas, but uh, with funding from uh, the Lone Star Prize, essentially to take everything I've just presented, so all of that work I've just presented, to adapt that same curriculum for training community health workers and other frontline health workers uh, in, in the delivery of depression care in, in Texas. Uh, so this is just an example of, um, you know, the foundational skills I mentioned. So this has been uh, adapted um, now for a U.S. context, again, following the exact same steps that I presented earlier, working very closely with a cohort of community health workers, uh, also expert reviewers, um, and then also thinking of the behavioral activation training, um, exact same treatment. It's actually the exact same treatment manuals uh, that we used in India, 
Uh, even some of the same content that we use for training the ASHA workers, the exact same uh, scripts that were orig originally in English, uh, and then entirely adapting those for a US context. Um, this is just demonstrating that this content can be very easily adapted to different settings. Also want to highlight that there, this has on, undergone you know, in, uh, intensive peer review throughout this process um, and review from uh, you know, psychologists, even uh, psychologists from the APA to ensure that you know, the American Psychological Association, making sure that what we're doing is retaining fidelity uh, to the original treatment model. So we're not deviating in any way uh, from the way behavioral activation uh, should be delivered. So this is the process for thinking of um, the training. So sort of expanding on that on that um, process that I showed the continuum in the last slide or a couple of slides ago, but really training the community health workers, but then also thinking more, what we've also had an opportunity to do with this, you know, expanding this work in the United States is thinking more carefully of how to um, <clears throat> address things around knowledge assessment, uh, competency and skills assessment, uh, and then really thinking of how to credential health workers so that then they have the skills ready to deliver care independently. All of this is modeled again on the work that's been done in India. But again, this is just demonstrating this process of taking work that applied in, in a, a rural setting in India uh, <clears throat> to a um, under-resourced setting in the United States. So one key thing here, I think that's, uh, you know, I think interesting to highlight is also this, you know, increasing emphasis on how to assess skills. Uh, so one of the things that we, so we use this, uh, you know, a knowledge assessment uh, really in, in, the, in the work in India. And we've now expanded that to think about, are there other tools that we can use to assess skills? Because I think one of the key things is assessing skills and competencies uh, for delivery of, of depression care. And it's very difficult to think about how to scale these. And one reason is that when we think of assessing skills of a health worker, it's usually through observation. Uh, it's usually through direct you know, supervision. Uh, direct shadowing, you know, with a with a senior clinician, um, and you have to think that these are community health workers working in rural settings, most always independently. How can we make sure that we're capturing not only are they doing it correctly, but then to identify where there may be need for additional instruction or additional support? Um, so, trying to think, innovate on ways to assess competency, um, and thinking of ways to leverage technology uh, to to do this. Um, so thinking of just some of the challenges ahead. So uh, when we think of digital technology, of course, um, you know, I didn't get into this today, but really the sort of the impact of the actual technology use on, uh, on, on our mental health and well-being, uh, as well as, you know, how, how use of technology can have an impact. Um, also thinking of, you know, there are digital tools that, that appear effective, but there's still a need for a lot more rigorous research and especially rigorous research across, uh, you know, a wide range of different settings. Um, there's a need to also consider this idea between balancing uh, digital, uh, you know, something that's entirely digital uh, versus digital technology for supporting care, much in the way that we're using it. So it's actually digital tools to support, um, uh, you know, real people who are delivering care. Or is it a hybrid? Um, that's another thing, you know, another option that we've been exploring is this idea that maybe it's a digital, you know, the ideal role for technology is a hybrid where you might have self-help tools for patients, but then also support tools for, for providers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also then thinking of some of the unintended consequences. So this is something that has come up in our work as the potential for confidentiality challenges. Um, this, where this comes up is especially when we're thinking of, um, you know, households where there may, they may share only one digital device. This is very common in many of the settings in rural India. Um, so if a um, <clears throat> community health worker is engaging in, say, supervision through her device, or she's supporting her patients through her device, who else may have access to that? Um, and making sure that there's ways to, to have safeguards in place. Um, there's also ongoing gaps in, in digital literacy, uh, equity, and access. These persist across all, you know, all the settings where, where uh, this work is taking place. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the gaps in, in access to technology persist. 
um, especially in, in you know, very rural and remote areas uh, among older individuals and also uh, you know, among women relative to men. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think there's reason to be very excited about a lot of this uh, work and especially the where, where technology is going. I think it, you know, it certainly holds uh, a lot of potential for bridging, uh, <clears throat> bridging the mental health care gap. Uh, it also, I, I think one thing to emphasize through all this work is the need to um, engage stakeholders closely throughout the development of any digital intervention. Uh, it's really, really key uh, that stakeholders are involved throughout the process, throughout the development, um, and making sure that when you're doing that, it's adapting the technology for the use in the local context. Uh, I demonstrate that not only for adapting it for the context in India, but also adapting it for the context uh, in the United States. Um, this is also building on the increasing uh, reliance on technology, which you know is one thing that's happened because of COVID. We've certainly seen this um, in the health system in India. There's much more openness now to, to use technology uh, and to adopt technology. And I think that's uh, been driven largely because there was a huge shift uh, to digital devices uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then also mention these opportunities for reciprocal learning uh, and how this approach can be replicated across other settings. So I, this is one example of replicating this in the United States, uh, but there's certainly opportunities to replicate this type of work uh, or other digital mental health work across other settings globally. Uh, so I will, I will stop there um, and just want to acknowledge the many, many, many uh, collaborators and funders for this work. Uh, certainly wouldn't be possible without, uh, you know, without this enormous team um, and, you know, really key collaborators uh, that have ensured the success of this work. And thank you very much for, uh, for your attention today and for joining. Dr. Naslin, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. And thank you for all this work that you've done, you and your team. I'm eternally grateful. I know the world is grateful for the amazing work that you're doing. Um, now we will give our attendees a little bit of time to ask some questions. We've already got a few that have been put into the chat, and I'm going to let uh, Laura Peer, the Associate Director of iChad, join in as well and ask you some of these, these great questions that we have. Yeah, so I can go ahead and read them. And um, Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds perfect. Please, so please go Ronald ahead. From Ronald Olam, Thank you for the wonderful presentation. How are you dealing with the ethical issues regarding data protection for the participants using the app? Yeah, so right now, um, the work that's, so the work that's being done in India, it's all being captured on a server that is based in India and it's uh, an encrypted server. So it, it follows the same, you know, type of encryption that would be required to meet um, the, I'm not sure if it's the GDPR rules, but it certainly meets the HIPAA compliance. So they follow something very similar to HIPAA. Um, and right now, um, the only, so the training data is, is something that's not as uh, insensitive because there's no, uh, no patient data, but the supervision data, that app that I showed at the end, <clears throat> that does have patient data in there. And that's where, oh, excuse me. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm just losing my voice. Yeah, so that that does have to be encrypted and then stored on um, on servers. So I, I can certainly find more information about that. I don't know the exact technical specifications of how it's encrypted, um, except that, that that that's through the Comcare app, which which does meet the um, certainly meets the legal standards in India, but then also in the United States. Great, thanks. Megan Manhart asks, in what ways did you adapt the program for the U.S. setting, i.e. different videos, different ways to present information based on how we use our phones, as you did with the population in India? What factors were considered? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So one thing is, is sort of a lot of it's role-play-based role, ba role play based training. So um, the... the um, Contextual adaptation was more around the actual training focused on depression care le than less around sort of, you know, how we use our digital devices. So we're, we're training health workers who are mostly actually accessing this either through a desktop computer or like an iPad or something like that. Um, and they're, they're health workers that are right now affiliated with a large health system. Um, we do plan to think of how, how can we, and, and community health workers as well. They happen to have a cohort of community health workers. Uh, but looking at thinking of how to expand this to other sort of non-clinical settings, that would be that's you know one of the key things that we're 
um, <clears throat> working towards. But the adaptations, just to give some examples, um, so many of the, you know, many of the trainings involve role play videos. So, you know, they, they show a, a therapist talking with a patient about, you know, it might be about a family issue, um, <clears throat> might be about something that happened. A lot of that had to be carefully adapted because it was very much focused on the Indian context um, and then thinking about how that could be then reflected in a U.S. setting. <clears throat> um, and then some small changes like, you know, rather than, you know, market or village, it would be like at the mall or the shopping mall or something like that. You know, there's a, there's a few things like that. The basic principles, though, were retained. I mean, many of the issues would be fairly, you know, the basic principles of behavioral activation were retained across both types of uh, treatments. A follow-up question to that. So um, in India, was how were the concepts of mental health issues and treatments um, similar to Western approaches or were, did that have to be adapted as well? Like the local yeah. population's understanding of mental health. Yeah, so that's an interesting, so the training um, does, I mean, the language especially, so thinking of how, how mental health is described, it most certainly had to be adapted. And there's ways that, like depression, for example, there's words that are used in Indian context that we we'd certainly don't use. So thinking of tension, for example, it's often referred to as tension, uh, you know, feeling of tension. Um, <clears throat> one thing I think that was really interesting is, is, so the training involves kind of this introduction to mental, you know, mental health care. Uh, and, and what mental illness is. But there was also, I think, um, quite an understanding, I think, already in the population. I mean, maybe partly because they were community health workers. So we were targeting, you know, community health workers that um, had maybe had been exposed to, to <clears throat> mental health care content previously. But I, <clears throat> but I think what I, what was, I think, interesting is that there, there was an openness to learning about mental illness, which I think means that they're aware of it either in the media or the news. It gets a lot of news coverage, um, and there's a lot of small local media outlets all you know all in you know you know all regions of India. Uh, and then mental health is becomes sort of like a topic that's re regularly reported. So I don't know if that's I, I, it maybe has helped with issues around stigma, but it also has had the reverse effect. It's made actually issues worse. Because uh, they often <clears throat> report mental health problems in kind of a unsavory light, so I think there was kind of this already this idea or conception of what mental illness was um, among the community health workers that that enrolled, um, and certainly the idea of depression. What I have observed in some of the you know in some of our ongoing work, because we also have a project that I didn't mention here, but focused on uh, schizophrenia care, and we've just recently wrapped up a pilot training the same group of community health workers about schizophrenia. Um, and what was really striking there is that they understood depression, they understood mental health care, but that was something that was like, they had no idea that that was a mental illness. It was actually, you know, something that was incredibly, uh, actually incredibly profound. They, they recognized it as something that they'd, they'd seen before in the villages, but they did not know it was a mental illness. They did not know it was treatable. They did not know there was anything you could do. Um, and I think that that was sort of, um, uh, you know, a real contrast to the depression, which I think maybe has, uh, been more, you know, widely uh, talked about, certainly among among health workers. But yeah, great question. Great, and we really are at time. But um, Dr. Catherine Amalundu was um, asking, and I, I know her, so I know she wants this information. <laughs> um, can we adapt this curriculum for use in an African setting? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, most definitely, absolutely. Yeah, you can send me an email. I, I'm sure I, she got your email address, but we'll follow. Yeah, up yeah, please you. do. No, I, I think absolutely. There's no. It can be adapted to basically anywhere. Um, just in response to that question above, we also are uh, translating into Spanish and creating some additional Spanish content for Hispanic populations in Texas. We started with English, and then uh, that's so that's one of the other adaptations. And uh, why Texas? Yeah, great question. Uh, they have very, very, very poor access to mental health care in Texas. I think it ranks among the worst in the country. Yeah, so there's huge need. It's uh, and it's yeah geographically and uh, you know racially and ethnically diverse, and uh, it's got many many other challenges too in terms of uh, delivery of care. So there's many reasons why Texas is a place. If it can work there, it, it could um, mm -hmm. serve as a model for many other. Well, the state itself um, in terms of meeting need, but I think also um, 
you know, really, I think, informing delivery across other settings. But yeah, it's a great question. Well, and we have great collaborators. We have great collaborators there too. So that's another piece. Thank you so, so much for not only this presentation, but for this work. Um, you're changing the world and we are eternally grateful to you and your team. Just to let you know that if you missed any part of this fantastic presentation, you can go to our Open Classroom website and you can watch it. We have reported the program. We'll post it in a couple of days. Um, so you can send colleagues to view it. And we're also going to try to get Dr. Naslin's slides and put those on there as well. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Naslin, for giving us this time. Thank you, uh, Laura, for this iChad series. Always amazing presenters and really important information. And you're just a, a, an incredible colleague. So I am personally grateful to you. Thank you to everyone here at the Brown School. And most importantly, thank you to you for attending. You're the reason we do this and we really do appreciate your time. You have a great day today. Thank you. Bye-bye.